Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content. everybody. My name is Jens Chapman and today is January 20, 2021. I welcome you to our STED Talks, Spine Technology Education Discussion. And today we could have the D also stand for deformity. Uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Frank Schwab, the Chief Emeritus of uh, Spine Surgery at HSS uh, in a little while. And he'll give a great talk on uh, kind of the summary of his findings on spine deformity classifications and corrections. It's a great honor to have him here, and we'll introduce him in greater detail uh, when he's live with us. As is our custom with STED Talks, we start with some interesting case discussions pertinent to the topic, and several of our fellows uh, are joining us this morning. I'm here in a socially distanced room uh, with uh, several of our colleagues and joined by my partner, Dr. Bob Hart, who's also going to co-lead the discussions. I um, want to welcome some of our new fellows who are here, and we'll introduce them as uh, the morning goes on. But we'll go to a, a dear standby now, uh, Dr. Elias Elias, and he's going to take one more swig of coffee, and he's going to take us into one of two cases, I think, of Dr. Hartz. So, Elias. So, good morning. Mm -hmm. So good morning, my name is uh, Elias. I'm one of the Spine Fellows here at uh, Swedish. I present two cases today. So the first one is a 58 female. Uh, she had prior uh, fusion, three levels uh, cervical fusion, four, five, five, six, six, seven, and prior lumbar fusion, uh, L2 to L4, as I, as I remember, for bilateral lower extremity pain and paresthesia. She presented uh, to Swedish with leg heaviness, right foot numbness, imbalance, uh, but she was still ambulatory, uh, and she reported leaning forward as the day uh, goes on. Uh, on physical exam, motor was fine. Everything was, uh, 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 motor power was five over five all over. So her pre-op uh, x ray scoliosis uh, are as follows. As you can see, the SVA is around seven centimeters. PI 66, PT 33, lumbar load dose is 8, and PILL was way more than 20. And the difference between C7 plumb line and CSVL was around 4.3 with a curb, curb angle of 24 degrees. So she was both, uh, she had both sagittal and coronal imbalance, and as you can see here, she has uh, some kind of uh, flat back. This is her uh, pre op MRI. So, uh, one, one second, uh, Elias, do you mind going back one slide? Yes. Sir. So Dr. Hart uh, is here and I'm going to ask you, Elias, the first question. Can you go back to the plane films? I find them very instructive. I have two questions. Uh -huh. The age old silly question. When I see that previous hardware in there between L3 and five, and I realize this is not our surgery and we probably don't have original images. Yeah, so this was... Uh, I want to hear from you. Why did this happen? Was this a problem of the previous fusion or is there some underlying other pathology? So most likely uh, she, already had, she, she already started with the uh, kyphosing and having uh, degenerative diseases and it was maybe uh, corrected with only a short construct. The whole picture wasn't taken, taken into consideration. So that's why she progresses over time. So Dr. Hart is one of the members of the ISSG and Dr. Frank Schwab, who will join us a little bit uh, later, yeah. is obviously one of the uh, leaders of this group as well. One of the increasing topics of discussion, Bob, has been the focus on any spine fusion surgery being more or less a deformity surgery. Was this just a surgery, and I want to be very careful my wording here, that was kind of just not done well enough in light of the severity of the disease, or was the fusion done in a way that it more or less propagated the problem? 
So uh, that is a great uh, question. And uh, the phrase you're referring to, I think it was Baru Zach Barnia, uh, maybe first said it, but uh, the, the, the quote is, every, every spine fusion is deformity surgery. It's either treating deformity or it's creating deformity. Uh, and uh, in this case, you know, I don't have the preoperative films, but if I can speculate, I guess, based on how this looks, my, my guess is that it was, um, you know, that there was already an underlying curve uh, and that this fusion, you know, was fused short into that curve. Um, and looking critically, I think if you look at the image on the left, uh, there's not uh, really a lot of lordosis in that construct. So uh, I think that's something that we've realized even in short, and in this case, a two level fusion, it's very important uh, to uh, reestablish uh, anatomic alignment to the greatest degree possible in the segment we're fusing. So uh, I think it, it may have, uh, impacted to have such a flat uh, segment, uh, certainly in terms of the uh, now the presence of flat back. I think that's a contributing piece of it. Uh, and I guess the only thing I would say at the end of all of that is uh, perhaps this was a, a reasonably chosen operation, uh, you know, without knowing uh, the woman's symptoms at the time and uh, taking into account uh, she may have wanted to remain active as a younger person. I don't remember the durability of this, but I suspect it may have been uh, present for a number of years because it, it doesn't look like something, you know, today, uh, almost certainly she would have had a, an inner body fusion as part of that, a T-lift of some form. This is just a posterior lateral fusion uh, with pedicle screw instrumentation. And so yes. you can make an argument if you get five years durability or certainly 10 years durability out of that operation, perhaps uh, it's a reasonable choice. So um, now having said that, uh, at this point, the presence of that fusion and the alignment creates a bigger challenge for us surgically uh, than uh, a situation de novo where there's, there's not a fusion to have to uh, work around and plan around for our operation. Mm -hmm. So Elias, just refresh our memory roughly as far as you know, how much time passed between that L3 to 5 fusion and when the patient came to see Dr. Hart? I think it was around five years. Five years? Yeah. Okay. So, Bob, um, I know trends come and go, and we kind of are always in a continuous pendulum movement as to surgical fashions. Uh, there was a clear time to try to avoid the major fusion surgeries, so the thought was to just decompress and fuse the really bad segments even if this ended up maybe in the apex of a curve, has that been pretty much absconded now? Is that gone? Or is there kind of a pendulum back, especially with MIS surgery, where we see more selective fusions being done? Well, I don't know that I can speak to sort of the whole uh, community practice. Certainly there is still uh, that manner of surgery being done. So clearly there are patients in the community that are having uh, decompressions without fusion in the face of deformity or uh, short segment fusions like this one. I, I think it, you know, it, it very much depends on the experience curve of the, of the surgeon uh, and the, and to some degree the, and it should depend to a larger degree on the patient's wishes. I think, I think it's important for surgeons to recognize that a bigger surgery is an option and to present that as one of the options to a patient like this woman at her uh, initial uh, at an initial encounter. Uh, so ultimately, it's up to the patient whether they want to accept the trade-offs uh, in terms of function of, and risk and, um, and the duration of recovery of going through, say, a pan lumbar fusion or a, a treatment of the entire deformity uh, versus a shorter uh, procedure uh, that has the possibility of uh, temporarily, at least, uh, giving them uh, greater greater function. One more quick question, Bob. So whenever I see uh, the pelvis APs, I look at the hip joints, I look for them being intact, and specifically hip replacements always kind of raise a, uh, an eyebrow or two on my end. So this patient has a level pelvis by all appearances, but uh, how much should we look at leg length discrepancies when we see pelvic obliquity? Again, not applicable here. Should we get more long leg standing films when the pelvis crest is oblique? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. So there's, uh, I do think that. So answering a slightly different question, I would say there is, you know, the the 
the the dogma when I think we were coming through training, certainly as I recall it, if you have a patient that has concurrent hip pathology that's untreated and uh, spinal pathology, uh, then the uh, teaching was let's deal with the hips first because uh, treating the hip may improve the symptoms of the back. It's a more predictable operation. It's less risky. And so that became the priority. I think we're recognizing now in deformity surgery in particular that uh, there are patients for whom we should treat the spinal deformity first. And it, those are the patients for whom the spinal deformity is creating sagittal malalignment. Uh, and the reason that that seems to be important is that for those patients, if they then ultimately undergo a total hip replacement, uh, the hip can be more reliably oriented, and particularly the acetabular component. Uh, there are patients who have uh, experienced uh, dislocation uh, following spinal realignment when their hip was placed first because the alignment of the, of the hip uh, was altered by the uh, alignment of the spine. Uh, and so that has changed the, um, you know, the order of operations, if you will, uh, if, you're, if, if both are there concurrently. Now, in a woman like this, she already has the hip. You can see the cup is fairly vertical. So I think it's important to have a conversation with this patient that changing the spinal alignment uh, may uh, alter the, it's going to alter the mechanics in some way, and it may unfavorably alter the mechanics of the hip uh, such that uh, she uh, becomes a dislocator after this. Now, you would expect the opposite because she's probably uh, hyperextending, you know, retro retroverting her pelvis. So she's making that cup more vertical and prone to anterior dislocation currently. Uh, whereas, and I think we'll see in the post-operative films, once we uh, realign the spine, uh, she's able to uh, relax her pelvis a bit. And that cup is going to be a little, uh, uh, there's going to be a little more coverage of the femoral head, I believe, after the operation than before. So it's more the opposite in this case, uh, but it can be, uh, it can be certainly an issue. Segue to the post-op, Elias, take, take us forward. Okay, so we'll go through the through the op first. So this was the uh, so this was the first uh, stage of the surgery. So uh, we uh, we removed the previous instrumentation with the posterior spinal infusion, P10 to S1, uh, all the way to the pelvis uh, with S2 AI screws. Uh, then we did three column osteotomies over the L3. Uh, mainly, mainly it was a Schwab for uh, osteotomy. And uh, a one level above uh, of uh, T lift. So this is the pre and post op uh, scoliosis X rays. As you can see, the changes in the parameters. So SVA now is 5.6, it was 7. And PILL mismatch is now 8. And it was above 20 before. And you can see the coronal imbalance before and after and the correction. So Bob, just uh, quickly before we go on another case, and so you did the inner body fusions to shore up the fusion after you did the posterior surgery for the bottom. Can you get any additional correction once you have uh, all that hardware in there, or how is that just a supplemental uh, foundational surgery kind of? That's as a second stage. I've, I've adopted this paradigm now. Um, uh, fairly routinely. So I, I say it's a reverse of the traditional teaching of going in the anterior first uh, and in order to use the anterior surgery as a deformity correcting procedure. Uh, I think the posterior techniques we have now are so powerful that we can get all the correction we need posteriorly. And then what we're left with is just a need to supplement to uh, ensure sure that we gain uh, bony fusion. And the point I would make around that uh, the pedicle subtraction osteotomy here, you saw that we included a T lift above the at, the, at the cranial disc above the osteotomy. Uh, but when you, in, unless you have an anterior column fusion, when you take down the posterior column fusion, which was solidly fused at L34, uh, once you take that down as part of the osteotomy, that now is dissociated. So you have to go back in the front and plug in a, a graft at the three, four discs. That one we put in posteriorly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I like to have an inner body graft at L5S1 as well. And so yeah, we, oh. we did that as a delayed A-lift also. So, yeah, so this is the second stage surgery that Dr. Hart was referring to. 
So uh, we did L5S1 A lift, and then we did L3, 4 uh, as O lift. So one question, there'll be, I'm preempting uh, a presentation of Dr. McBride later. Uh, uh, the highest rate of non-unions of L5S1, talk to us about the four-rod construct philosophy. So you've obviously applied the working rods, as um, Dr. Shell has put it, over the osteotomy side. So they go from roughly, I'm not sure I can count the levels correctly, L1 uh, to the L5 level. Um, why would you not yeah. take them down to the pelvis and have supplemental fixation down at the pelvis? So this is one, one uh, variation, I guess, of uh, some kind of quad rod construct, which has now become, I think, pretty much the mainstay. Um, certainly in my own practice. Um, we call these satellite rods as they're not attached to the uh, primary rods from tendon pelvis. Um, uh, we call them outrigger rods, I guess, when they are uh, attached in some form. Um, I think, you know, it's a, it's a matter of augmenting the mechanical strength of the construct. And I really like this, uh, this pattern in particular. I think, you know, what we do here... <clears throat> by taking the osteotomy off of the main construct, we really are isolating it uh, and creating an environment for it that is, it's going to be even a higher fusion rate, I think, than what we can get with a, a two-level T-lift, let's say, because we, not only is this a two-level T-lift, uh, but it's a two-level T-lift protected top and bottom from all of the forces uh, directed through that construct. So the the forces on those um, the satellite rods here are, are essentially zero. And uh, so the chance of solid fusion through that short part of the construct is, is really, I think, quite high. And uh, that has remained, you know, the, the, the bugaboos of defor adult deformity surgery uh, continue to be uh, junctional failures and uh, non-unions with rod fractures. And so I think uh, in the last five years, particularly, uh, maybe longer, the surgeons are really working to address uh, those risks and reduce those risks for our patients. And I think quad rods has been uh, an important part of that development, uh, particularly as, as, it regards, as it relates to reducing uh, incidence of non-union rod fracture. Okay, just, just, so, a, just a yeah. small word about uh, Schwab classification, because we did a Schwab 4 on this case. So mainly we have six types of uh, Schwab. Type one is when we remove partially the facet joint. Type two, when we remove complete the facet, we completely remove the facet joints. Type three, when we start removing uh, part of the vertebral body. Type four is when we remove part of the body plus the upper uh, disc space. Five is when we completely we remove the body and the discs. And six, when we remove more than uh, one vertebral body. And thank you for this. Did one. you want to show your second case right now? Yeah, sure. Sure. Why don't you go? We'll go a little bit faster on that one. So the second one is. Second one was done by both Dr. Hart and Dr. Skuyan. So second one is. It was done with a slightly different technique. So this is a 67 female, has rheumatoid arthritis. She's an IV drug user, but she said that she only inhales the heroin. She never injected heroin. History of bilateral septic risk, uh, and she had IND for it. Well, and she still has a virgin spine, no previous spine surgeries. She presented uh, for an outside hospital before Christmas for uh, T12, L1, osteomyelitis, and discitis, and severe pain. Uh, she had aspiration over there, which showed uh, gram-negative rods, and she was discharged on antibiotics. Uh, later, she presented to our uh, ED with severe worsening back pain. So her ESR was 50, white count was 10. Motor power was normal, but she had severe back pain. This is her CT scan. Uh, so she has degenerative disease. And as you can see here, it, it shows some uh, osteomyelitis over the T12 L1 area. So this is the CT scan. This is the MRI. So this is the same area. You can see here uh, the disc space. It shows the discitis. 
between the T12 L1. And there is some kind of collection uh, over this area, over the epidural space. Uh, it was read as uh, epidural uh, abscess. So as you can see here, this, this was read as epidural abscess. If you go back again to the CT scan, so if you go back to the CT scan, we can see that there is some kind of calcified disc over the same place, over the 12 L1 area. So it was a question mark, is it uh, like an infectious case or a calcified disc? So, so yeah, so one second. So this is, uh, if you go, yeah, stop there. So this is one of those real big questions. We don't want to delve into a discussion of the spine infections or the Nova infections right now, but here we have a really bad constellation of a patient with a number of systemic problems, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, significant substance abuse history with complex uh, um, life endangering drugs, spine deformity, and now an infection. So uh, the, the big question I have um, for Dr. Oskuyan is, and I'll reach my mic, oh, you have that one, is how should you treat this? Should you isolate the infection management first and kind of get rid of this epidural thing and get the infection to settle down, or should you try to get the, uh, the deformity treated also? So fortunately, uh, Dr. Hart was on call, so he had to manage um, these complex issues. Um, but, uh, it's difficult because we kind of talked about it and, um, you know, does she have an infection? She has a deformity. Um, I think my feeling on it and I'll let Bob comment is that you can't just focus on that one, do one or two levels here. I think if you're going to do something, um, she's going to fall apart. And so our, our kind of, we wanted to manage the infection, but also look at the deformity because she also had stenosis down below and a spondylolisthesis. So we made the decision to do a bigger surgery. We actually involved her in the decision process um, and um, very complicated socially, psychologically, and was not an easy uh, decision for both the patient and the team. So Bob, when uh, we don't want to delve too much into this infection discussion, but when I look at this case, and we obviously don't have long-standing films given how sick she is and how she's now neurologically impaired. When I see this, I have to think that to some degree, this end-stage degeneration may have been a kind of a focal point for uh, an infection uh, kind of uh, uh, more or less condensation or kind of a focal point to instigate an infection as an opportunistic seeding ground for bacteria. Is that a reasonable, unreasonable statement? I, I certainly thought uh, this was an infection looking at that uh, MRI and uh, the 12 one disc, you know, very high signal content there. Um, in retrospect, what we found, I believe, was was uh, probably an, uh, a non-infectious discitis, right? So she does have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and I suspect that's why uh, that looks the way it does. Um, I think your point is a good one. We we went in in this woman because of the concern for infection. And by the way, her inflammatory markers were elevated. She had already been treated with. Um, three weeks of IV antibiotics and seemed yeah. to not be improving on that. And she'd had an aspiration, which did not grow out uh, on culture, but which was read as positive on gram stains. There were a few other features here that really suggested that this was highly likely to be infection. And you alluded to her um, social setting. We had a conversation with her family uh, on two occasions preoperatively to help with the decision making. And in the COVID era, that was done by phone rather than in person. But um, she she does have a history of heroin abuse, but she smokes heroin. She swears she does not inject heroin, um, and she says she uses it for uh, pain control. All of that very unusual and and uh, unusual both from the standpoint. Well, it's just something I don't think I've ever had a patient report to me, uh, but uh, that that is who this woman is. Uh, so. Um, you know, we, we take our patients as we find them, and particularly in a sitting, setting like this, um, I think uh, your point is a good one. We didn't have the typical ability to plan uh, the, the posterior realignment to the same degree that we would like to. Um, I, she does have almost a fixed uh, amount of lordosis, L3 to pelvis, and the, the, it, the imaging doesn't do that justice, but the CAT scan 
shows the facets are just nearly fused down there. And when we had her on the table, uh, it was clear that those were just almost rigid and, and, and uh, not uh, very mobile. So this is a woman, having said what I said about anterior column fusion, I don't think we're going to have to go back to the anterior column. We've got a quad rod construct posteriorly. We did no laminectomy below there. And so I think we've got a lot of fusion bed uh, and already a very stiff construct. So we focused really on the on the uh, uh, short segment deformity, uh, which was kypho kyphosis and kyph uh, kyphoscoliosis at uh, thoracal lumbar junction. And, and you can see we did a two level, uh, and actually Dr. Oskuyan did this portion of the procedure, the two level interdiscal osteotomy there uh, with cage placement. And I think we were able to get uh, you know, a very nice correction uh, through uh, uh, relatively, uh, relatively more limited uh, bone removal as compared to a three column osteotomy. And I would call this really a three column osteotomy. It's a, a variation. And I think uh, Elias may have some commentary on how this relates to the Schwab classification, but it, it, it probably is, it's maybe a, a necessary addition to our armamentarium now and to our classification system uh, as some, as, as this is used more and more commonly. So Elias, is this a Schwab three and a half or a Schwab seven or what is this? This could be like IDO plus. <laughs> so separate outside of the Schwab universe. Dr. Yeah. Schwab is going to join us shortly. So he just texted. Yeah. He is on his way. How's the patient doing? So she's fine now. She's still having some pain medication. Uh, she's, she's difficult to, to, to deal with. Okay. So that's a very nice correction. So you did everything together. You did the infection management. You did uh, the neural decompression. And you did a very nice realignment. So... So far, so good. Obviously, it's still early. It's a relatively recent case, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Elias, for Thank those you. two very interesting and very, uh, uh, I think, compelling in different cases. Let's bring Dr. Nuna out. And thank you, Elias. And again, we're going to be joined by Dr. Schwab momentarily. He just texted he's on his way. And Ravi, after you're connected, just briefly, if you will, introduce yourself. Thank you, Lee. I want to thank Lee and Ashley for um, all their technical support today. You can focus today is spinal deformity, and uh, we have Dr. Schwab uh, giving us a lecture on an update on what should we do. But uh, for another uh, look at deformities in the complex circumstances, Ravi. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, I'm Robbie Nuna. I'm one of the uh, spine fellows here at SNI this year. And I've got a recent case that uh, we did here with uh, Dr. Oskuyan. This is um, a 75 year old female with severe osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, stage 4 kidney disease, heart failure. She has a pacemaker in place, so she cannot get an MRI, and she's also had some heart surgery. She presented over the course of the year, of the year with a progressive disabling mid back pain low extremity numbness, worsening urinary incontinence, frequent falls, and uh, progressive loss of ambulatory function. Her physical exam revealed a pretty good motor strength uh, throughout with about four out of five weakness in lower extremities, uh, no pathologic reflexes except for some de de uh, decreased reflexes in the lower extremities and uh, uh, numbness in the lower extremities as well. These are her plain films. Unfortunately, we do not have um, global standing films, but as you can see here, her uh, pelvic tilt is 28.5. Um, so you get a point for the Schwab classification there. Her PI LL mismatch was pretty low at 8.1. So we, no points there. And um, she did have a very mild uh, coronal deformity in the lumbar spine uh, between L2 and L4, 23.3, but that doesn't meet criteria. And she had a very, very significant uh, thoracic kyphosis of 74.4 degrees uh, between T2 and T12. Um, and again, she wasn't able to get an MRI, but uh, we did obtain a CT, which showed um, some kind of likely infectious process between T10 and T11. Um, interestingly enough, this patient um, had a low white count, inflammatory markers were low, and um, only risk factor was type 2 diabetes and um, severe uh, chronic kidney disease for some kind of infectious etiology. 
Um, also um, challenging for this case was that her bone mineral density was extremely low. Her Hounsfield units was uh, 66 at L1. Um, her estimated SVA was about seven centimeters, uh, not on these pictures, but um, by splicing together a couple of different views. And she had significant multi-level uh, lumbar stenosis um, down below her uh, deformity. So the Schwab classification here for a curve type would be N, uh, zero points for PILL mismatch, then one point for SVA, and then one point uh, for the PT. Um, so on this patient, we elected to do a large deformity correction, and we did a posterior spinal fusion from T4 uh, down to the pelvis, uh, dual rod construct. And here you can see uh, some of our corrections, and you can see that she improved in terms of her uh, pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis mismatch from 8.1 to 0 0.7. Uh, pelvic tilt um, was corrected from 28.5 to 16.6. And then thoracic kyphosis basically decreased by um, greater than 50% from 74.4 to 36.1. At T10, 11, we elected to do, uh, as Elias just um, also showed in his case, an intradiscal osteotomy. Um, we did not um, end up doing a full corpectomy or a PSO at this level for correction because we felt that she had enough bone there to uh, perform an IDO. And basically, you know, as we said, that would be kind of either Schwab 3 or Schwab 4, kind of a, a hybrid osteotomy technique um, that we have found to be less morbid um, here at Swedish. So I think, um, you know, obviously very, very, very good correction. Uh, she's still on the floor, but she's doing quite well postoperatively, and um, we're hoping to mobilize her pretty soon here. Uh, just some quick review of the literature. Um, as I alluded to, the um, SRS Schwab classification has been around for quite some time now. This is one of the largest studies um, out of the Red Journal that just validated um, this classification system. It was a multi-center perspective study of uh, 527 patients looking at the Schwab classification and looked at many, many parameters and basically um, showed that um, in terms of looking at operative versus non-operative care, um, you know, more severe curves were associated with a higher Schwab classification. And then in terms of the sagittal modifiers, more and more points were obviously associated with increasing rates of operative intervention. And then most compelling was the fact that uh, most patient reported outcome measures were also, um, you know, closely associated with the Schwab classification, as you can see here, both in terms of comparing operative and non-operative groups, but also in terms of comparing the uh, major curve types as well as the uh, sagittal modifiers. All these parameters were very, very um, closely associated with, um, you know, the Schwab classification system. So I think it's uh, it's something that's, you know, come into vogue and we're using it more and more. And it's definitely a great learning tool to kind of um, create a framework for looking at uh, spinal deformity. So can you go back again? Thank you for this uh, literature review also. So this is an, uh, a beautiful deformity correction. Uh, Bob, as we're looking at spinal deformity classifications, obviously the geography and curve magnitude and general alignment uh, with the goal to reestablish that cone effici efficiency that Dr. Jean Dubusset, who's a frequent lecturer here, has identified as a goal. But uh, are we missing something like here? This patient has had a significant spinal column collapse, a fracture, an erosion. Are we missing the underlying pathology that's kind of led to this? I mean, here this is a very focal problem uh, with a fracture in an extremely osteopenic skeleton. So aren't these significant modifiers that we should kind of take into consideration as we're trying to quantify the deformity? So, so I think... Um... I think what you're asking is uh, the role of bone density. Um, for instance, the density or the fact that there's a fracture which would yeah. allow for more focal uh, deformity correction. Right. So uh, I think we've spoken in, uh, uh, about that issue in other contexts and, and recently about this patient because we, we spoke about her in conference uh, as we do uh, with most of our patients preoperatively uh, as a group. Um, you know, I, the concern here is if we focus uh, the surgical attention just on the deformity, yes, you can technically go in and correct that with a short segment construct of, say, three levels of screws above and three below. The, the problem with that in a uh, woman with bone density issues, particularly uh, older individuals uh, really uh, in general, is the the uh, potential not just of proximal failures, but distal failures as well. And I think 
this woman, unless we do this kind of fairly radical appearing surgery, uh, including fixation to the pelvis, uh, she's, we're setting her up for failure uh, and a need for revision surgery. So I very much agree uh, in, in, in this context with this amount of uh, uh, kyphosis in particular uh, to uh, to include uh, distal fixation all the way to the pelvis as, as part of the construct. So thank you. So so you showed very, and can you go to the post up please, Ravi? Thank you. Uh, it's a very illustrative case, beautifully done, but can I ask you to critique, uh, I'll just show some fire over here to the left side of the room. Uh, it, it, there's only two rods in here. Is that an under treatment? Should, a, should there have been more rods? Uh, you know, I, I probably would have placed four, but I'm not going to critique this decision making. This is, you know, I think this is uh, really the way we've historically done this uh, and continue to do it. And again, in a situation like this where we're not, um, you know, if you look down there and I'm looking at L3 to pelvis again, those discs are nearly at three, four, and four, five are nearly, uh, nearly bone on bone. I think. Uh, and there's a large fusion bed without the need for a laminectomy here. So the, uh, you know, the purpose of the uh, more rigid construct is just to increase fusion rate. I think this has a very high likelihood of solidly fusing in the distal portions. One more material question. So if we rely on two rods for a long fusion, um, sh what metal should we use? Should we use titanium? Should we use a 5.5, five, a 6.0, or a 6.25, or whatever fraction? Should we use cobalt chrome? So what's the best metal to try to avoid uh, fatigue fractures? Well, there's, there's, I think there are going to be new alloys uh, that we're going to be able to work with. Right now, the three that are available are uh, cobalt chrome, titanium, and stainless. Uh, stainless has issues regarding imaging uh, quality, and particularly with CT scans, just sheds a lot of uh, scatter. So I think most surgeons are using either titanium or cobalt chrome. Uh, a 5.5 five cobalt chrome rod is equal in strength to a 6.0 or 6.35 titanium rod. Um, I have found that the 6.35 cobalt chrome rods are just a bear to, to contour in the operating room. Uh, and in addition to that, there is some suggestion that there's more of a problem with uh, late infections. And I've had that in two patients that I treated with cobalt chrome rods. I think uh, Munish Gupta has done some basic science research on that, suggesting that there's a better bacteriostatic effect from titanium as opposed to either stainless or uh, cobalt. And I have to say my own experience bears that out. I've never had a long, uh, you know, a, a delayed, you know, greater than a year after a surgery uh, infection, a delayed infection of a spinal wound with titanium. I've had it both with stainless and with uh, cobalt chrome. And so my preference is for 6.0 or 6.35 uh, titanium rods. And one more material question, actually one and a half question. So um, what is more notch sensitive? When we bend rods, you talk about bending rods. What material is most notch sensitive? Well, you're asking me a question. I don't know the answer titanium. to titanium. That's the worst. problem. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, that's one problem. All these material tests have been done with straight rods and yeah. not with bent rods. That's but when true. we use these French benders, uh, which we all use, yeah. uh, there's a notching created. Yeah. So so definitely. titanium is very notch sensitive. That's what I was leading at. Fair enough. So there there, there definitely is a notching. Uh, no matter what bender you use, I use the bending <laughs> irons still, as opposed to the French benders. But they they also create notches and and. Um, you know, I think we're we're getting to an era now where we're going to have patient-specific rods. That's already available. Uh, we're we're we haven't had them on contract here until fairly recently, but I think we'll have them available in our armamentarium. And those are contoured without notching, and and look forward to having uh, having those available uh, as part of our treatment armamentarium. Hey, so Rod, so this looks absolutely beautiful. So, how did the patient do, and what do you do to prevent this from collapsing at the top of the construct? So um, I don't I don't know of a strategy to prevent uh, the adjacent level or proximal junction failure, but I think you and her that what was interesting is I think this was a Charcot type fracture. It was very what, very what, unstable. What does that mean? Can you tell the audience what why you say Charcot and what um, that implies? So basically, um, uh, I think she probably fractured this and then. Um, developed kind of an instability at that area um, and it mimics an infection 
Um, but you know, we didn't didn't find any evidence of an infection there, but it was very unstable. So I think, you know, just given her osteoporosis and her overall comorbidities, um, we just went with one rod and uh, used uh, 6-0 titanium. Um, and actually we used the pre, these were pre-contoured rods. So we just dropped them in. We just cut the tip off. I mean, it was very slick. So what did you do uh, to prevent this from collapsing on the top? I think the rod, having the rod pre-bent honestly makes a big difference because usually we're having to kind of use in situ um, contouring and trying to get the top to go in and use reducers. In this case, literally, Ravi um, uh, was there. We just dropped the rod and it went in perfectly. Um, so I think that's, um, that's one thing I think that can help. Um, and then the other thing, obviously, is trying to get good fixation. And Ravi showed she had no pedicles. Yeah, she I mean, literally, one to two these were the pedicles wow. we had to deal with. Yeah. Bob, so, why does why does this happen? Uh, is this a congenital thing? Is this uh, collagen insufficiency from CSF pulsations? Uh, what the Dickens uh, leads to that kind of these pedicle aplasias or dysplasias? Well, I think this is sort of one version of uh, of normal. Um, you know, it's genetically programmed. These these thoracic uh, the thoracic pedicles often are uh, very diminutive and. Uh, you know, when when I was coming through training, uh, the the teaching was that we're never going to use pedicle screws in the thoracic spine because the pedicles are too small to accommodate them. Uh, but I think we learned how to place extra pedicular screws, let's say, and the, people call it the in out in technique. So uh, working lateral to the pedicle or with the lateral surface of the pedicle, as opposed to trying to cannulate the uh, entire pedicle. Uh, this is this is not a case of scoliosis. So you you do see in patients that have adolescent idiopathic scoliosis uh, an asymmetry where the the concavity the pedicle on the concave side uh, is uh, much smaller than the pedicle on the convexity, and I think that it, uh, reflects the uh, dural pulsations that you're talking about. But why this woman one ended up with such small pedicles, you know, I, I would guess I would argue she probably was just genetically programmed uh, to develop in that way. So final uh, question before we go to the final case, uh, prior to Dr. Schwab's lecture. Um, you wrote one of the landmark papers, Bob, on upper versus lower thoracic fixation and long fusion constructs and patient-related outcomes. What should I, as a surgeon who is going to go to clinic shortly, tell patients in terms of the differences of outcomes and impact on life between lower thoracic and upper thoracic fusion constructs? So, so stopping proximal stopping points, uh, it's still, I think, an unanswered question to some degree. And I think um, the paper you're talking about from, from ISSG was... Um, was an analysis of how stiffness-related effects differ between uh, patients with upper thoracic versus uh, thoracolumbar starting or ending points, proximal junction. Uh, and we found that there was very little difference in terms of function. So uh, the amount of flexibility and perceived flexibility and the ability to do uh, activities such as toileting and dressing and other uh, activities of daily living was really unaffected by the proximal ending point. So I think, you know, the, the, in, in some cases, there are, the deformity dictates, and I think this would be one, that deformity dictates that we go uh, higher than thoracolumbar junction. Um, uh, and uh, I think we can inform our patients that, yes, there's a little longer uh, duration of surgery, probably a little higher blood loss, uh, maybe a little longer recovery, maybe a little longer, a uh, little higher risk profile. Uh, uh, it's it's minor, if if anything. Those effects are minor, and the ultimate functional outcomes are uh, no no different in terms of uh, in terms of again their ability to do activities of daily living. Rod, how's this patient done? Um, she's done. She's done great. I mean, obviously, uh, she's had some issues um, post op, um, but. You know, um, she uh, can actually get up at the side of the bed and walk around. I mean, she truly was debilitated, um, couldn't even get up and, and due to pain. Um, she was intact, obviously, but this had gotten to the point where she was literally bed bound. 
So one final case of the morning prior to Dr. Schwab's lecture. Can you introduce yourself? Good morning. My name is uh, Paul McBride. I'm one of the uh, fellows here at Swedish. I'll be presenting a case uh, of Dr. Chapman's uh, that we recently did. This is patient uh, JB. She's a 73-year-old female. She presented with over 10 years of stabbing, left-sided, uh, low back, and leg pain that was severely limiting her daily activities. This, this was refractory to conservative measures. Um, on exam, she's full strength, normal sensation with no pathologic reflexes. Her general health was, was pretty good. She's a BMI of 22, non-smoker, non-diabetic, uh, fairly active, and um, maybe even a little too active, and, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but her DEXA score was in the osteopenic range of uh, minus 1.5. Here are her standing scoli films. Uh, you can see a pretty severe uh, thoracolumbar kyphoscoliosis. Um, she's got a PI of 34 and a lumbar lordosis of 18, putting her mismatch in the intermediate range of the Schwab classification. Um, her SVA was 5.3, uh, also putting her in the intermediate range for the Schwab classification um, with a pelvic tilt just under 20. Um, for comparison, in the bottom right of the left image, I put up her x-rays from 2006 that we had in our system uh, from 14 years ago. And you can see uh, she does have a, a thoracolumbar curve, but it's much less. So I think you know, degenerative factors were, were a, a primary driving force of this, um, of this curve. Um, she also has a loss of uh, thoracic kyphosis. Um, so moving on to her uh, CT myelogram, there were no significant areas of, of stenosis, but you can see the expected um, facet arthropathy, uh, neural elements shifted over towards the concavity, um, and then the expected sort of reactive uh, osteophytic changes, uh, most notably at the thoracolumbar junction, and osteophytic changes and vacuum disc phenomenon. And do you remember what her bone density was? Uh, minus 1.5. Thank you. So go, go back again. Uh, that was really nice how you showed that old picture. So Dr. Hart, so uh, trying to understand what the nature of a curve is obviously helpful. This is one that puzzles me a little bit because uh, we have obviously an older film and that nice insert that Paul put in there and then the later date thing. What was this? Was this an old untreated idiopathic lumbar sclerosis because there's a fair bit of rotation in there? Um, or is this all just a degenerative uh, decompensated process? Assume there's a normal citizen, very active, no drugs, no systemic diseases we're aware of. Yeah, uh, so uh, is that film, do you know how, how long ago the film, the small inset? 2006, 14 years ago. 14 years, yeah. So no, I think you're, you're, you uh, hit the etiology on the head. This is a small idiopathic curve that uh, for years didn't trouble this woman. And I think you can uh, judge it to be idiopathic based on the rotation, as you mentioned, and the pedicle asymmetry of her to look at the CAT scan. I think that's uh, clear as well. And um, so now what has happened is I think a combination of bone density issues and uh, just, you know, uh, just the degenerative nature of, um, of uh, our spines really for most patients, uh, most of us have some form of degenerative disc disease by the time we get to her age. And obviously it doesn't lead to this consequence for most of it, but in her situation, because of the deformity that was already there, uh, the, it, it progressed uh, as, as we see here. And uh, clearly now very poorly, very, very malaligned, uh, both sagittally and coronally. Well, that's helpful. Uh, was stenosis a factor in your assessment, Paul, as you looked at her case? She didn't have any significant canal stenosis, but she had the expected neuroforaminal stenosis on the concavity. Did you happen to look at, this is a mean question, her uh, patient reported outcomes. We collect those routinely in all patients. Did you look into that? No, I did not. Yeah, so um, no fault here. I didn't uh, tell you how to do that, but uh, we record all patient-related uh, reported outcomes. And a remarkable thing, this is a pretty substantial deformity, I think we can all agree. And the patient actually did not have that bad of an um, adverse score. I forgot the numbers, but they weren't that horrible. So, uh, uh, so again, she has a very power of positive general uh, outlook. So what do we do, Paul? So we took her for a uh, two-stage procedure, first stage by Dr. Esculian, uh, left L3-4 and 4-5 lateral inner body fusion. Um, and you can see on the coronal uh, CT scan on the left that, that you couldn't see initially, but she's actually fused at the 2-3 at the segment on the left on the concavity side. 
Um, but this was the initial stage. Um, stage one two. second, one second. Yes. So Rod, uh, when do you go from the concavity? When do you go from the convexity age old question? And how much does it help to release the far side to try to get some separation of vertebra? So um, I've kind of battled that for the last 15 years. And I don't think there's a right answer. I kind of look at more at the plexus. Um, and, and each patient is very different. Um, on this patient, I went, um, I like to, I tend to go from the left side um, because these deformities are so, there's so much rotation. It tends to be a little trickier to deal with a retroperitoneum on the right side with the large colon, the rectum, um, and the ascending uh, structures. Um, I also looked at, I look at the kidney um, and um, the plexus tends to, on the concavity, be a little bit easier to work with. But then again, it just really depends. I think on this case, we ended up making the right decision. I tend to go from the left. That's kind of my go-to. And what do you do to break through that far cortex? You obviously were able to really yeah. separate those vertebrae. You didn't intersusept those cages into the vertebrae. So how do you break that apart? Very carefully. Of course. Thank you. Any tips or tricks, or do I have to visit your lateral course, which is um, coming up? We can't share any of the information right now. When is the lateral course? You have to come course? to the lateral course in February. February. Okay. Thank you. All right. Carry us forward, Paul. Stage two is completed by Dr. Chapman as a T4 to pelvis uh, construct with hook and wires at the top. Um, there were three, um, three column osteotomies in the intradiscal form at T12 L1 and L1 L2, where eccentric uh, cages were placed, and then bilateral cages were placed at L5 S1. Um, and laminectomies were completed in the entire lumbar spine. And do, do you have the post-operative standing films then? Yeah. Post-op standing films on the right um, compared to the initial films on the left. You can see um, a, a large improvement in, in both the coronal and the sagittal planes. Um, we've introduced a good amount of um, a lumbar lordosis. The thoracolumbar uh, kyphotic deformity is gone, and there's an introduction of um, some thoracic kyphosis. Um, her SVA is improved. Um, no complications? No complications initially. Bob, this is a case of mine. I was very proud of that at the time. Dr. O did a beautiful job setting us up, and then we completed it. And I'm going to tell you that there'll be a complication. Um, what did I do wrong, if you want to predict what's going wrong? Well, um, I suspect that we're going to see a proximal junctional failure. And uh, the reason I'd say that is, First of all, it's one of the most com common complications. So uh, just playing the odds, uh, that would be what you might expect. I think, um, you know, I I'm not sure that there's a technical fix to that in every case. Um, I, you know, you, you wanted to get the alignment correction that you got, and that was important uh, for this operation, for uh, the patient uh, to, you know, uh, experience success from this. So um, I do use a prophylaxis at the proximal junction of a tether between the UIV and the UIV plus one. Uh, I run that between the spinous processes and then tie that uh, mercilene tape down to a cross link that we then tension with either compression or distraction to uh, to tighten up that tether. Um, I've also done a similar thing using the rib of the UIV plus one vertebrae. So looping a, a, a tether around the, the uh, rib of the UIV plus one and tying that into the primary construct. I think the biggest thing in my own hands that has helped is uh, is making sure that the rods are reduced into the upper screw before we place the locking nut. And I'm going to, I'm going to repeat that because I think it's a critical element. So, uh, I lay the rods in, I get the bending irons out at the top and I bend the rods down into the upper end of the construct so that the, the, uh, locking nut doesn't create any reduction force on that upper screw. So in, in that way, we eliminate or reduce the, um, the pullout force on the upper screw. And I think that is a critical element. 
And then uh, we've shown uh, the work in ISSG has shown that um, that getting our alignments appropriate uh, is uh, is critical. So uh, you know, matching the uh, sagittal profile to the pelvic parameters uh, that is something we shoot for in younger patients, but we've come to see that uh, that needs to be te tempered a little in uh, older patients, and uh, uh, that's something Virginie Lafage has really led. Uh, the conversation and the analysis on that, uh, showing that we need to adopt age uh, appropriate alignment goals. So uh, a 70 or 80 year old does not need uh, perfect sagittal alignment. And in fact, that's less than ideal in that setting, as opposed to somebody in their uh, 50s or 60s, let's say. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, Dr. Schwab. Frank, can you hear us? I've been told he is live. Yes. Good morning. Morning, Thank how are you? You look great. Um, yeah. So we're going through a final case, and I hope you're well. I know you're totally busy, and so thank you so much for joining us. Your awesome. name has been very much mentioned with all sorts of classifications and osteotomies this morning. So your name was not held in vain. It was uh, re referred to in praise. I uh, want to join. I don't, Bob Hart. I don't know about that. I don't know. <laughs> I want you to join no the, the prediction raffles. So, if you can go back to my case there quickly, I know you didn't hear all the details and want to, for the interest in time, not go through them all, but assume this is a Paul. How old is the patient? 73. 73 year old patient. And we saw some pre op and post op films and we went through all the numbers that you and your group have really helped us advance care with. I want you to predict what will fail. I did a nice surgery. The patient had no complications, and at three months, she looked great. And can you see those images again, just the before and after juxtaposition? So what's going to fail? Dr. Hart just predicted that it'll fail rosterly. I'll tell you, something will fail. Nothing has failed yet. She's doing great. She's three months out. Hmm. Well, let's, uh, let's hope nothing fails. Let's go with that. No failure. I love your optimism. Thank you. And I'm not going to ask Dr. O. So take us ahead. What failed? And then you'll tell me what I did wrong. And then so, we'll go to your lecture. So she failed distally. She failed at the lumbosacral junction. Um, like I mentioned in the initial slide, she's a very active, uh, healthy lady who does yoga and intense stretching and, and flexing and extending of her back. So um, she presented to a virtual appointment uh, three months after surgery with these films on the right. And you can see uh, bilaterally her rods have kind of interestingly popped out of the tulip heads um, from the S2AI screws. Uh, there were no rod fractures, but they had disengaged from the, um, from the screw heads themselves. Uh, on the CT scan that we obtained after seeing the uh, standing x-rays, you can see the windshield wipering of the S1 screws bilaterally, as well as the right uh, L5 screw. Um, and when you compare from her uh, initial uh, post-op images, there's some loss of um, SVA, as well as some loss of uh, lumbar lordosis, uh, kind of expectedly. So, uh, this was so let me ask you, um, the, the iliac screws, are those eyelet closed screws or are those uh, regular tulip top loading screws? Um, those are from a manufacturer that has created specialized pelvic screws, but they're not like the Medtronic variants. Uh, so they have an open head, a more a regular reinforced tulip. So the, the flanges of the tulip heads are stronger than the conventional screws, but it's not a locked pelvic screw. Great question. Yeah. Well, so I, I had issues um, a few years back when I was using a lot of um, stuff from Medtronic, and it's not to pick on Medtronic, just that was my experience. And um, the, um, the tulip heads disengaged rather often for these long constructs, too much for me to feel comfortable with. And then you have a cascade of failure, then you get uh, you know excessive loading on S1 and then L5, and this kind of thing would happen. And then I went to a variant, an older system of Medtronic, just for the iliac screws, it was as a closed eyelet. Um, and that really helped pretty dramatically. So I don't know. I'm, I'm always fearful of, of uh, the loads on those iliac screws. And um, uh, so this is not an uncommon failure mechanism, I would say. Um, and, and maybe it's, it has something to do with the closure and really the extreme forces that are put onto that area. And it sounds like the patient was pretty energetic. So that sort of sets you up for this a little bit, unfortunately. 
Thank you for your erudite comments. I have a question along those lines. Should we routinely fuse the SI joints in these patients? I did not fuse that patient. These are long screws. They're uh, assumed that the CAT scan shows that they're very well placed. So should we fuse the SI joint to take that kind of toggle out of the loading on the pelvic screws? So I don't think so. I've seen a lot of patients that had attempted SI fusions and that are very unhappy. Um, so first of all, I think it's very, very hard to fuse the ISI joints, despite uh, some of what's um, been said. There are probably some very experienced people who do it well, but there are many patients who have unsuccessful SI joint fusions and are uh, really pretty miserable. So I'm not sure that we should go down that path. And the other is really the, the iliac screw is, is a backup screw that uh, it only needs to, to, to be there uh, functionally for let's say six to eight months, right? Once you have a consolidated fusion, um, its role is pretty much over. Uh, and every once in a while we'll remove a, an iliac screw because it's prominent or someone doesn't like that it's there or whatever. Uh, so I don't think that the answer to this is to fuse the SI joint. Uh, hard to fuse, would take a long time to fuse. And when the iliac screws fail, they tend to fail early, um, such as in this scenario. And I don't think an SI joint fusion would have avoided this. Um, I think an SI joint fusion here would have probably just created um, more issues for the patient. So I think I think you did a great job, and this is just uh, it's a mechanical piece and it's a mechanical failure of that piece. I always love talking to you, and thank you for the positive encouragement. Paul, take us out of the case so we can switch to our lecturer. So tell us what we did. So we did a revision where we did fuse our SI joints. Uh, we replaced the bilateral S two AI screws. Um, uh, barring any issue, mechanical issue with the tulip heads. And we replaced the S1 screws and the right L5 screw and placed bilateral iliac bolts and ran a, a quad rod construct down to protect the lumbosacral junction. And how did she do from that? Uh, she did great from that. She's discharged and, and out of the hospital. So four pelvic screws, formless ice uh, fusion. We used a new kind of a screw augmentation system with an allograft by a company whose name I'm not going to mention because it's CME here, uh, but we augmented the uh, S1 screws with an allograft uh, product, which was really satisfactory. And we used a full four rod construct. So more metal, uh, not satisfactory. Uh, should we routinely use four rods for these long constructs to kind of offload the focus on one screw, or should we just have specialized pelvic bolts like what you said before, Frank? Uh, so I think this, um, I think the four, the four screws are what's going to solve this. Um, and uh, there is some mechanical work that was done, as you know, on do you make them parallel or divergent or convergent. And it, it turned out, ironically, that the long screws parallel to each other seem to be stronger than convergent diversion, which is surprising to me. But but I have gone a number of times to these four screws and uh, and until now I've not seen a failure, a single failure of a four screw iliac screw construct. So I think it looks perfect. I again I'm not sure if the SI joint fusion was necessary, but I think I think you probably have a lot more experience than I do and 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 maybe maybe it's a really good approach, but but here I think putting in those four screws should lock it up. I, I don't routinely put in four rods because it's rare that the rod fails. It's more the connection that fails, and um, you know we do four rods for our our PSOs, our VCRs, um, but I haven't done it for long constructs to the pelvis in any routine fashion. So I'm not sure it's essential. Um, I think it doesn't help. I mean it doesn't hurt. Um, but as you say, a little more metal, a little less room for bone graft. So I, I don't do it routinely, but I will, uh, for complex cases or for very osteoporotic or osteopenic patients, put in four rods. And those that have failed with pelvic screws, put in, put in four screws, not four rods, four screws. So it looks great. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.